Hi, I'm Greg Dell with Dell Disability Lawyers. I'm here with attorney Stephen Jessup. And Stephen, today we're going to talk about a case that you resolved recently for a radiologist. And we're going to use the facts of that case to also talk about some things that would be tips for radiologists who are seeking disability, uh, maybe on claim already, or have actually been denied claims. So let's first um, start with the background of this particular case for the radiologist that you assisted. Yeah, so this was a client who'd reached out initially to, for assistance in applying for the benefit. Um, she kind of specialized in just doing, uh, you know, reviews uh, for breast cancer, you know, doing all the, uh, you know, examinations, taking a look at the radiological reports on that. Um, she had a private individual disability uh, through UNUM. Um, and she had been having issues with depression, anxiety, stress, just panic attacks, things along those lines. She had been treating for some time uh, with her doctors, but the symptoms continued to get worse. She wasn't able to get you know, her work done on time. It was taking her longer and longer. I uh, just try to get through as many uh, you know, reports and everything to be able to you know, identify if there was a cancerous tumor, things along those lines. And the stress of that kept building and building to the, the point that she was almost frozen with the idea of, of maybe making a mistake and missing something and, and potentially resulting in a misdiagnosis of, you know, of breast cancer. Um, so she was looking into applying under a policy. She wasn't sure if they'd pay her benefit. You know, She's like, I, it's not like I can't physically do the work. It's not a problem physically. I just can't focus on it. Um, and one of the things that we had discussed and could be problematic was she did have a lengthy history of treatment. Well, and then sometimes right, tell us about the how long had she been treating before she was going to seek a claim? I mean, she had been, I would say, in a semi regular fashion, five, six years, okay. right? So it, it's been a, a while, you know. Now, we, uh, treatment amped up and increased through over the period of time leading up to the filing of the claim. But as you and I know, one of the concerns we would have is you know, I'm looking at it and saying, well, you've had these problems and you've been able to continue to work you know, despite them, so what's changed? That was one of the big obstacles probably in trying to establish that she is getting to a point where she can't do the occupational duties. And with that scenario, especially with mental mm -hmm. nervous, this was depression or mm -hmm. anxiety? De depression, anxiety. Both. Mm -hmm. Is that it's almost like a double-edged sword because if she had come to us and said, I'm having depression, I've seen the doctor for a month or two, mm -hmm. we may be like, well, they're gonna say, okay, you're in that recovery period, mm -hmm. you're still early on with treating, plus you know these policies, especially when they're private, have at least a 90-day elimination mm -hmm. period. So after 90 days, they would be like, well, we think you need more treatment, or maybe we'll approve you initially, but usually with these anxiety depression claims, I find the disability carriers give you a six-month window max, and then they're basically like, why aren't you back to work? Yeah, I would agree. Okay, so that's when someone comes in, a, in the route where it's a newer episode and they've done the limited treatment. The reverse is the situation we had in this claim where she had five, six years of treatment and then we see that carriers like Unum and all of them basically mm -hmm. do the same is, well, you've done it for five or six years, you've been managing it and like you said, what changed now? Like why all of a sudden can you not do it? And that was the biggest challenge. So I don't know which one I find more difficult, you know, between the, the person who's been treating for a long time or the one who's been treating for a couple months. Well, adding to that level of difficulty in, in her situation where she'd been going, you know, treating for years is also the concerns of, you know, her, you know, being a doctor, you know, if she's telling her, her doctor, she was hesitant to say she's having issues at work because she's always worried about potential malpractice, things along those lines. Like if there's documentation and she's been having issues and she did make a mistake, is that going to come back to her? So she was unfortunately for a while unable to really focus on the issues per se that may be amplifying it because she was concerned about how that may be construed, you know, in some other, you know, way. And I think that was also a, a symptom of her condition, that kind of like that paranoia and stress and the anxiety over that. Um, so that kind of really made it hard. It, it wasn't initially a lot of good information from her doctors about how it's imp impacting the, the work duties, right? Right. And with radiologists specifically, it's a very high stress job. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the, the claim reps who at Unum or wherever who review these claims don't understand. They think, okay, we're not talking about interventional radiologists yep. here because that's a more physical type job. We're talking about the most of the radiologists who are, mm -hmm. you know, in front of a computer eight to 10 hours a day, some working in a hospital environment, although nowadays everybody can be wherever, it doesn't matter, but it's like sometimes they need the results mm -hmm. right away. You gotta be dialed in and focused. Um, everything is time sensitive and if you miss something, I mean radiologist is one of the number one malpractice type claims, like how did you miss that yeah. on the particular scheme? So it's a very high pressure job 
And a lot of times, like with our client, the stress wasn't necessarily coming from the job. It was other sources in life or maybe even an unknown etiology as to what was causing her stress. But then that type of inability to focus carries over into doing her job. Yeah, if you start to question yourself outside of work in day-to-day -day life stuff, it's going gonna, it's gonna to permeate into the work. And that's what, that's what happened with her. And in, in this particular case, to further improve, I know we did neuropsych testing. Can you talk about why that's important? Like how that goes to further provide additional evidence, mm -hmm. even though we weren't necessarily claiming she had cognitive difficulties per se. Yeah, so in this situation with the neuropsychological testing, a lot of times it is meant to verify a neurological basis for it. Um, now, she did not raise to a level of a mild neurocognitive disorder because there was nothing neurologically causing the problem, but the testing did show a, a multitude of issues with recall, attention, you know, uh, executive functioning, all related back to a severe mental health condition. So we didn't get a formal diagnosis of a cognitive right. problem, but we had evidence of cognitive issues related to the mental health. And that was really what gave the objective evidence. You know, yeah, mental health claims is always like, well, how are you feeling? You should be doing better. Like right. you were saying, oh, it's been three months on this new medication. Has there been improvements? You should go on another. So they're always looking for, you know, what's making you feel better? And, and that's not anything can really be, you know, quantified or qualified. So the neuropsychological testing was a way to at least could a glimpse and show if she's having a hard time making it through six hours of testing on something that's meant for someone of an eighth grade education level, how can you expect her to go through hundreds of scans and not make a mistake? Right. You know, and she worked for a large hospital system with a big cancer center, so it was high pressure. It was a lot, a lot of pressure on her. The other thing is that we, and remember, she hired us to do her application, mm -hmm. which lots of doctors, business professionals, employees, everybody, it's a unique service that we offer in terms of helping before things mm -hmm. happen. But in anticipation of knowing the way that Unum looks at claims, knowing that our client had been chronically ill and this, basically if she went on disability, she wasn't going back, we said let's go ahead and get this mm -hmm. neuropsych mm -hmm. because if we didn't, then we believe that Unum was going to go ahead and get their own and not that we control the results, but we're able to at least know mm -hmm. what's going to happen because when you do those tests, you're not supposed to repeat them more than once every year. Mm -hmm. The other reason we like to do it is that and is that the insurance companies do it to try to say you're malingering you're exaggerating your symptoms and here we are able to put the claimant through that neuropsych exam and see are we going to get a result of malingering mm -hmm. or exaggerating because we only know what the clients tell us yeah and we don't have any contact per se with the neuropsychologist so the test results are completely independent of what's going on with us so we like to do those tests as well to come back and say here it showed no more lingering, no exaggerating, therefore your complaints are valid, and basically taking the ammunition away mm -hmm. from the insurance company, which is you know, very smart planning that usually isn't done. And really, the psychologist or psychiatrist that was treating our client had no reason to ask for a neuropsych test because she wasn't claiming any cognitive difficulties per se. She was just claiming the things you talked about, difficulty focusing, balancing mm -hmm. what was going on, and motivation to even do the job. So. Um, getting the neuropsych was, was really critical and, and guiding her through that process. And now that you got her approved, mental nervous claims are like the most challenged claim of any, basically, because there's usually no objective evidence. So how do you continue to represent her on a moving forward basis to help put her in the best position to avoid a claim denial? You know, they're, they are still requesting claim forms. Um, they have started to limit the amount that they want from her doctor, mainly from her getting updates on it. Um, you know, it's maintaining her treatment. You know, her policy is an older policy, so the own occupation language in it is very strong in her favor about the specificity to her work. And I really think that the neuropsychological testing early on really set the stage for the success of the claim and, and how it has been. Uh, so it's just a matter of making sure she's consistent with treatment under the appropriate care of a physician, which she is. She, she certainly is, you know, the psychiatrist, the psychologist for therapy and all that stuff. And, you know, just knowing, you know, what Unum is going to look for. Uh, and generally speaking, you know, she's also of an, an older age. So for them, there's an understanding of a, a liability, you know, to pay out on this claim. Uh, whereas if you're younger, we see that they're a little more aggressive on it. Um, but in her situation, I think that with the support of her doctors, they were phenomenal, you know, in going to bat for her, speaking to Unum's doctors about what's going on, uh, that everything was set up so strong in the beginning that they didn't really have too many places to try to punch holes through the case. 
I, I think the other thing that we commonly see with psychologists and psychiatrists is that their medical records are terrible. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> many more of them are going to the digital, so at least it's typed, because it used to be back in the day you couldn't yeah. read anything. Yeah. But also psychologists and psychiatrists have relationships with their patients, mm -hmm. more so than the regular type doctors who patients come in you know, once every two months. Yeah. Most people go in once a week for therapy, a psychiatrist once every two months. And so the notes are just bare, like the doctor really builds a relationship and knows everything, even though the notes are just little cues to mm -hmm. remind the doctor as to what was going on with the patient last time. Because the psychologists and psychiatrists are trying to get the person to the next level with every visit. But in disability, what they do is they look at the records, and if there's not much meat in them, they go, there's, no, there's nothing in the records to indicate what's wrong with you. So I know we worked with her and all of our clients to say that you've got to encourage your, psych your treating psychologist or psychiatrist to put more information in the records. And even if it's not in the records down the road, then I know we work with the doctors to get a detailed explanation as to what's going on based upon whatever records the doctor yeah, may have there. It's important you said, because a psychiatrist is mainly medication management, so that's more formal, which you see the psychologist. Um, you know, and a lot of times people may have where their psychologists or therapists don't release the session notes, uh, the privacy right. of it. So then it's really important that their notes are good enough for themselves to give a detailed explanation in a letter, uh, you know, going through what the treatment is, what the issues are, the, you know, the global functioning issues, things along those lines. Well, um, congratulations on this uh, accomplishment for this radiologist. I know we represented a lot of radiologists, um, obviously thousand, more than a thousand claims against UNUM. It's a high level specialty that really needs to be understood and presented because disability insurance companies tend to manipulate it and make it just like it's a sedentary mm -hmm. desk job, which yeah. it's way more than that, obviously. So if you're a radiologist or someone who has a UNUM claim, no matter where you live in the country, we're available to assist you. We encourage you to contact us for a free immediate phone consultation with any of our disability attorneys.